Thanks for inviting me to speak here. Um, so today I'll talk about uh, simulation extractability of Vietnamese ZK snacks. Uh, this is going to be based on two different works, uh, one joint with uh, Claudio, Mahek, Akira, and Daniel, and the other is joint with Hamid, Markov, Anka, and Mihel. Um, okay, let's begin. So I want to begin with a uh, motivating uh, application. Um, and my motivating application is going to be that of the blockchain. So we have this uh, ledger that is sitting up here and uh, people want to uh, convince each other of several assertions and they want to do it uh, without leaking their secrets. So suppose I want to convince the world that I know the secret key of a public key that is up there uh, on the blockchain. I want to be able to do it without giving out the secret key itself. Um, and therefore, uh, we, want to we want to post proofs on the blockchain uh, that support these assertions that we make. And these proofs are publicly verifiable um, and they preserve privacy. So let's uh, begin the talk by looking at um, zero knowledge proof systems because that is what uh, ZK SNARKs are. They are a kind of uh, particular, uh, there are particular kind of zero knowledge proofs. Um, so zero knowledge proofs were introduced by uh, Golvaza, Mikali, and Rakov originally with interaction. And here we have a prover, um, we have a public function f, and the prover is claiming knowledge of a secret witness w such that f of w is y. Uh, so they interact in uh, several rounds, and at the end of the interaction, uh, the verifier either accepts or rejects the proof. Um, we want the property of completeness, which says that if the statement is true, uh, then an honest prover should be able to convince the verifier. And then we want the property of uh, it being a proof, that is, we want soundness. Um, if the statement is false, no matter what the prover does, the prover should not be able to convince the verifier. And finally, we want the property of zero knowledge, which is the privacy property, which says that if the verifier is cheating, then the verifier cannot learn anything uh, beyond the truth of the statement itself. And this is formalized by asking for the existence of a simulator, uh, which I will not get into in today's talk. Um, another property is that of uh, succinctness, where we ask uh, how efficient can the verifier be? Can the verifier be convinced without expending uh, too much resources? That is, if the prover is trying to convince the verifier uh, of a very long computation, um, so F takes a certain amount of time to run, will the verifier have to run that long? And the property of succinctness uh, says that verification runs in time that is logarithmic in the size of the witness. Uh, and if we have a program representation of f, then we want verification um, to be logarithmic in the running time of the program. Uh, so a zero knowledge succinct proof is an extremely powerful uh, primitive, and um, it, it, it allows us to construct uh, proofs of computational integrity. Um, however, there are uh, two buts. One is uh, that it is interactive and it cannot be posted on the ledger like we saw in our first motivating application because um, if a prover wants to convince the entire world about uh, some statement, the prover cannot uh, interact with everybody. We, we want it to be uh, non-interactive, one that is like one shot. And second, um, this construction, the original construction by Killian uh, also had poor concrete efficiency um, because it was based on uh, PCPs. So even though asymptotically it achieved uh, succinctness, the, the concrete constants are huge. Um, so the first problem is easy to tackle. Uh, we ask for non-interactivity explicitly. So what we want is a non-interactive uh, zero-knowledge proof, uh, where again, the prover has a statement. Uh, it's claiming that it knows W such that F of W is Y. But instead of interacting with the verifier in several rounds, uh, there is a one-shot proof that the prover sends. And the verifier um, inspects this proof and decides to accept or reject. So we have the same properties as before, uh, completeness, soundness, and zero knowledge, but the only difference is the prover only sends uh, one message, which is the proof, and the verifier decides to accept or not based on this one message. Um, so a ZK snark uh, is basically um, the, the, uh, the non-interactive setting. So what we have uh, is the following. It is a zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive, uh, argument system, uh, not these kind of arguments, but by arguments, I mean uh, proof systems where the soundness is computational. So um, what we mean is proofs for false statements exist, but they cannot be found efficiently. And we want arguments of knowledge um, where we strengthen the soundness property by asking for the existence of an extractor 
where um, if the prover convinces the verifier, then there exists an extractor that can extract a valid witness from this prover that convinces the verifier. And this is a proof of knowledge, and I'll, I'll, I'll not make the distinction between argument of knowledge and proof of knowledge from now on. Okay, so this extractor, it must be non-efficient or something? No, it will be efficient, but it will have other kinds of powers, like it has Oracle access to the prover and it can rewind the prover, um, or it knows the trapdoor of a CRS, or it is non-black box and it has access to the randomness and code of the prover and so on. Thanks. So the first ZK snark um, was given by Mikali, uh, which came a couple of years after um, Killian's succinct proof. Um, and this is basically in the random oracle model where uh, we have a hash function and we assume that it behaves ideally. Um, so every time uh, we query this oracle, we get a random looking string. And in this model, uh, Mikali constructed a snark. The problem of interactivity now goes away and we can post uh, succinct proofs on the blockchain. Um, however, the problem of poor concrete efficiency still remains because uh, Mikali's construction uh, inherits all the PCP inefficiency um, because this construction is essentially Killian's construction where the prover is thinking of um, Killian's uh, construction in its head, um, making it non-interactive in the random oracle model and then shipping it off to the verifier. So the, the, concrete, the, co the concrete constants are uh, still large. Um, so a second era sort of in ZK snarks was uh, started basically by asking the question about assumptions. So if we are not in the random oracle model, um, can we construct uh, succinct non-interactive uh, proofs? And um, the result by Gentry and Bix basically uh, told us that we do need strong assumptions. That is, um, we cannot construct uh, snarks in the standard model under um, falsifiable assumptions. So given this negative result, uh, there were a bunch of uh, positive results that constructed snarks making strong assumptions like knowledge assumptions, um, like linear only encodings. And these constructions were uh, later recharacterized as being based on uh, linear PCPs. So they didn't need the full power of PCP, uh, only linear PCPs uh, suffice. And linear um, so, PCP is a PCP where like each bit of the proof is linear function or is it linear length in terms? Of... Um, so the queries from the verifier are not point queries, but they are vectors. And what the verifier receives is an inner product of the proof string with the query string. Thanks. So, um, so here is the uh, setting for uh, our ZK snacks today, where we have a non-interactive proof just like before. Um, but now we are going to have some help. So we don't have the random oracle model anymore. So now we need some additional help. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix the function about which the prover is going to be uh, making assertions. And before we start using our snark, this, uh, this trusted party who is helping us is going to sort of sample uh, some coins, run a setup procedure, and return a proving key and a verification key. Now this proving key is large, the verification, verification key is uh, short. And these are both public. So these are both public keys. Um, and after this, after we have this help in the beginning, the prover uh, can now use the proving key to prove as many proofs as he wants for different inputs and outputs. And the verifier uh, can check this. Um, so a series of works in this setting um, has given us many uh, constructions. This is called the pre-processing model, where we pre-process the function f. Um, and after we pre-process -pre f, uh, we can have really short proofs without, uh, without a random oracle. So well, today... Uh, mm -hmm. And just a verification question here. Is it important that f is chosen before the randomness is produced or...? Um, so in this setting, in the pre-processing snarks, uh, yes, because this, the CRS is basically uh, a template for what a correct computation of F should look like. Um, but later I'll talk about universal CRS snarks where we don't have to fix the function beforehand. We only need an upper bound on the size and then we can prove uh, statements about different Fs even. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so today um, we know proofs that are as uh, short as three group elements, regardless of uh, how long the computation is that the proof is uh, attesting to. And the verification is very efficient too, 
um, where the verifier only has to perform a constant number of uh, pairings and a number of exponentiations that is um, linear in the, um, in the size of the public output. Uh, so Y is the claimed output, which is public, and it has to perform a um, number of exponentiations that is linear in that. Um, so, so, so jumping ahead, these pre-processing snacks will, um, will have a dependence on F, and uh, morally, we can think of the setup as creating a template of what um, a computation of F correctly done should look like. And when the instances come in, when the input output pairs uh, come in, the prover is uh, really proving that the input output is consistent with this template that the setup has given us. So the setup uh, is expensive. Chaya, uh, sorry, can I ask a quick question in regarding mm -hmm. the computational complexity of the verifier? Uh, yeah. I don't see any dependence on the verification key length. Is that true? Uh, yeah, so the verification key uh, can be as large as uh, just the size of Y. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, um, so, so the setup is as expensive as computing F itself. And after that, uh, the verifier can be efficient. Um, so here in this, in this uh, pre-processing world, uh, we can think of many uh, variants depending on uh, different parameters. Uh, one is about the dependence on F, um, and, and I'll talk later uh, about uh, getting rid of this dependency where we can get universal snaps. Um, and whether the setup is cheap or expensive, um, here in the pre-processing snark setup, again, the setup is as expensive as computing F. And um, again, we can have variance depending on whether the randomness uh, chosen by this party to construct the proving and the verification key is secret or public. Um, in the most efficient snarks that we know today, um, the, the parameters that I've given here, like three group elements, um, the randomness is, uh, is secret. Uh, what this means is um, this the common reference string. Um, so I put the proving key and the verification key together and I call that a CRS. We can separate them for the sake of efficiency later. Uh, so this common reference string has an explicit uh, trapdoor, the knowledge of which allows one to give uh, proofs for false statements too. Uh, so uh, there is a secret randomness to the SRS that we really have to keep secret uh, if we want to preserve soundness. So a party who knows the secret coins of the setup uh, can break the integrity of the proof system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we can think of proof systems with public randomness, which are called uh, transparent proof systems um, that we'll get to a bit later. Um, we can also distinguish based on uh, who is convinced by these proofs, or do we have public verifiability or do we have designated verifiability? Um, if, if anyone in the world is convinced, then we have a publicly verifiable proof, which are the most interesting ones for most applications. Um, but for uh, applications like outsourcing computation, we can also have uh, designated verifiability, which, which is weaker, but still makes sense for uh, certain applications. So in designated verifier setting, um, there exists a party who holds a secret key, and it is that party that is convinced of the proof. Um, so going back to this uh, secret randomness in the common reference string problem, um, the question is who sets up these keys? So initially we started by saying that it's this trusted party who's going to set up these keys. Um, but the problem is in practice, uh, if the setup is corrupt and if this randomness is uh, known, um, then soundness can break. And this is actually a problem because if you think about uh, where these proofs are used in practice, like in Zcash, if there exists a party who knows the trap door, um, then they can print money at will. So it's really important in practice to think about um, who is performing this uh, setup for us. Um, and one way to deal with this is to replace one trusted party with multiple parties and have a tailored multi-party computation protocol. Um, however, um, this is really a mitigation um, because um, if the pre-processing depends on the function f, um, then there exists an operational cost. Every time in the future we want to design a proof system for a different function f, we want to run this um, cryptographic ceremony of the MPC uh, again. And if this uh, receives less scrutiny, then again, we are in trouble of uh, certain parties or one party holding the back door and breaking soundness. So performing uh, one trusted setup per application uh, may result in the trusted setup uh, not holding uh, trust anymore. So more recently, um, 
people have come up with a different model where we don't have a single trusted setup. Instead, um, what we have is something called an updatable common reference string model, starting from the work of Roth et al. in uh, 2018. Um, and here, uh, the model is as follows. We have one global uh, common reference string, and uh, parties can continuously come and add their own randomness to it. So I can take a CRS that is out there, CRS1, contribute my own randomness to it, uh, perform an update to get a second CRS, and some other party can come along, perform another update, uh, get the third CRS, and so on. And what is the guarantee that we get from this? Um, the guarantee is that we have security. Uh, by security, I mean the CRS is good or backdoorless at any point after we have had at least one honest update. So, so think about it as um, the update or the trusted setup, sampling some randomness. Um, and by trusted setup, we mean that a party telling us that, uh, hey, I sampled some coins, here are the keys, and I deleted my randomness. And we don't want to trust this one party. So instead here, we are saying, okay, we don't trust any one party to delete their randomness. But as long as there is one honest party who is contributing to this update and is not colluding with everybody else, then there is partial uh, trapdoor that is missing. And therefore, um, there is no backdoor in the final updated SRS, and we still have soundness. Chaya, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what happens, uh, I mean, what other property, like uh, security guarantee do you have on a malicious user? Can it like just mess up the CRS and it be no longer functional? Uh, yeah, but the, but these updates also come with uh, correctness proofs. Like you can verify that the update is uh, correct in terms of the CRS structure. I so see. if a so malicious party be... tries to mess up, uh, then the verification will fail. So every update comes with an update and an update proof, proving that- And there must be some happening. form of consensus across some group of parties for the update to happen. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so if we think about uh, applications for uh, these succinct zero-knowledge non-interactive proofs, they have plenty of uh, applications even beyond uh, the blockchain world. Um, there is proof of solvency where we want an exchange to prove that it is solvent uh, without revealing um, its own assets or its customers' balances. Anonymous credential systems, even outside of blockchain, uh, use zero-knowledge snacks. And uh, systems that try to balance accountability and privacy and scaling solutions like ZK Rollup also use um, snarks and recursive composition of snarks in order to, um, in order to scale uh, blockchain. So the question we asked today um, is that of malleability. And I want to begin by talking about um, transaction malleability and then I'll get into uh, proof malleability. Um, so consider the following um, setting in Bitcoin where um, there are certain transactions and the transaction uh, ID is basically hash of the transaction string and each transaction consists of, uh, of a signature. And uh, these transactions are malleable in the following sense. Um, if the signature is malleable, uh, then a malicious party can simply maul uh, the signature into a new signature, create a new transaction ID, and uh, the attack scenario is that um, the adversary can convince a sender to make a certain payment more than once uh, by simply uh, mauling the signature in the following way. So uh, Im imagine a scenario where as a recipient, uh, I get a payment where a particular transaction uh, TX is the transaction that is making the payment to me. Um, I maul the signature and I broadcast to the network the new transaction ID, uh, which is the TX ID prime. And then I go claim that TX ID was never included in the blockchain, which will be true because as far as the sender is concerned, uh, the original transaction ID is the unmalled one. And then the sender makes another payment um, and I, I get paid twice. So, um, so this is this is a problem arising out of malleability where the sender is not able to recognize uh, their own transactions on the blockchain, um, and this is because of uh, malleability of signatures. Um, in the in the context of zk snacks, um, where uh, zk snacks are used for privacy preserving transactions like in Zcash, um, the question is: Does the proof of knowledge property uh, suffice? And what I mean is, um, so uh, proof of knowledge is the following, uh, where we ask that for every malicious prover uh, that convinces a verifier about a statement, there exists an extractor 
uh, that either has black box rewinding access to the prover or non black box access to the prover can output uh, a valid witness w star such that every time the proof verifies uh, w star is, uh, is valid for the instance x. And now, uh, if we look at applications like, say, transaction privacy, um, where the kind of statements we are proving using ZK snarks are um, taking some old coins and some public values, and the computation says, uh, here are some new coins, and the proof that attests to the fact that um, these old coins are valid, and I did the correct transaction arithmetic, and uh, here are the new coins. So the proof attests to the statement. And uh, the kind of guarantees we get if we use a ZK snark to prove the statement is that um, an owner of an unspent coin can produce a valid proof and parties who do not have ownership of an unspent coin cannot produce a valid proof. We, these are roughly the properties that we get from um, the proof of knowledge property of the ZK snark. However, um, can an adversary adapt a valid proof to be used on a different message? And this, this is again in the context of malleability. So if you look at the blockchain application again, um, a prover is, is actually seeing multiple instance proof uh, pairs on the blockchain. Um, so a malicious prover uh, sees proofs x1 pi1, x2 pi2, x3 pi3, and now um, can potentially uh, maul or even combine them in different ways uh, to produce a proof for a different instance x star. And uh, can a prover do this without knowing the witness for x star? So this is a guarantee that is not provided by uh, the proof of knowledge property of CK snacks. So what we really need is the property called simulation extractability, which captures this additional power that the prover has in terms of uh, seeing other proofs. So the prover is not operating in a standalone setting. Instead, the prover gets to see multiple instance proof pairs. So this captures non malleability And uh, the way we define it is by giving the prover access to a proof simulation oracle where uh, the adversary can query the simulation oracle with instances and receive many proofs. And finally, it outputs an instance proof pair. And um, the, uh, the property that we want is, uh, is that we ask for the existence of an extractor again that outputs a witness W star. And um, if, the if the malicious prover gave us an instance proof pair that is fresh, that is, it was not any of the proofs it saw from the oracle, then we want the extractor to succeed. Right? So, um, so the adversary gets to see multiple instance proof pairs. And uh, if the adversary sees all of this and outputs a fresh instance proof pair, then the adversary wins. So we want to say that if the adversary outputs a new instance proof pair, uh, then again, we, uh, we demand the existence of an extractor that gives us uh, the witness for the new instance that the adversary has output. Quick question, sorry, uh, Chaya. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. This uh, definition is, uh, I mean, to my recollection, many one, right? It receives many, gives one. Uh, mm -hmm. But in applications, you would want many, many, no? Uh, sorry, what do you mean many, many? Like gives many Like proofs? it receives many proofs as well mm -hmm. as gives many proofs and you want to extract every proof from every proof that the adversary gives. Um. So you're saying that doesn't follow from simply- I, I, I don't recall the I don't recall the literature here. It, it's a long time since I worked in this area. I sometimes many, many can be reduced to many one, but depends on the application. Like I, I don't know if there is, like you have, have you used the simulation extractability in like sort of a Zcash functionality to prove something or like this, you're just going to talk about many no, one simulation. I, yeah, I'm just going to talk about many one. Um, the Zcash uh, example was just to motivate. I'm not going to tie it back. Uh, I, I should also say that Zcash handles it in other ways. It's not that um, Zcash is not simulation extractable. Uh, it's just that they have to um, add one-time signatures and include the signature key inside the instance that they're going to prove in order to avoid such attacks. Um, instead, if they had used a simulation extractable ZK snark, it wouldn't be a problem at all. Okay, that's okay. And we, we can take this offline anyway. Thanks, Chai. Um, yeah, so, so throughout, I'll be working with this uh, many one definition where the adversary gets to see uh, many instance proof pairs and um, uh, finally outputs one instance proof pair. Um, okay, so, so the question is, do ZK snacks um, satisfy this definition of simulation extractability? Um, and to answer this question, uh, widely used uh, ZK snacks today are um, 
typically designed as interactive arguments and later compiled into a non-interactive version uh, using what is called the fiat shoemaker transform. And uh, simulation extractability for uh, fiat shimmy transform protocols are known only for um, three round protocols uh, like Sigma protocols. And these results do not extend to uh, currently used ZK SNUCs. Um, I'll talk about the technical challenges soon, uh, but at a superficial level, um, the reason why known result of simulation extractability of Sigma protocols do not extend to our setting is because we have multi round protocols. Um, Clonk and Sonic and Marlin are constant, but still more than three rounds. Uh, bullet proofs are logarithmic. Um, moreover, uh, we are in the common reference string model, um, whereas existing result is uh, does not take care of a CRS. And uh, when we are in the updatable setting, there is the additional challenge that a malicious prover can even contribute to the randomness of the CRS before trying to attempt a forgery. So this, this is something we have to take care of in the definition. Okay, um, so in, in one of our works, one of our recent works, we show that uh, bullet proofs satisfy uh, simulation extractability um, in the algebraic group model, uh, which is an idealized model. Um, and in another work that is not yet on ePrint, uh, we show that um, uh, constant round snarks, uh, constant snarks based on constant round interactive arguments like Marlin, Plonk, and Sonic also satisfy simulation extractability um, in the new definition that takes care of updatability of the CRS. Um, before talking about our results, um, I just want to uh, spend some time talking about what the Fiat Shumate transform is. And um, let's begin by looking at simple Sigma protocols. So let's look at um, the Schnorr's protocol for proving knowledge of discrete logarithm as our running example. So here we have a group of uh, prime order Q and a generator G. And the instance X is G to the W and the prover is claiming knowledge of W such that X is G to the W. Um, the protocol proceeds as follows with the prover sending the first message, um, A, which is G to the R for randomly chosen R. Um, there's a challenge from the verifier. And the third message uh, is the opening from the prover, uh, which is R plus uh, CW, where W is the witness. So this is a three round uh, protocol for proving knowledge of discrete logarithm. Um, the verifier finally just checks this one equation. It checks whether G to the Z is A times X to the Z. Uh, let's quickly verify it satisfies um, the properties of a proof system that we talked about. Um, so completeness, completeness holds if we simply look at the verification equation, um, G to the Z, uh, Z was the prover's third message, uh, recall it was R plus CW, and this is indeed A times X to the Z, so an honest prover can indeed convince the verifier. Um, for soundness, <clears throat> um, so here, um, if we think about it, um, Membership in the language uh, can be sometimes trivial. Uh, for discrete log, there always exists a discrete logarithm. So what we want is actually the stronger property of uh, proof of knowledge that a prover who is convincing the verifier knows the discrete logarithm, not merely that it exists. Um, so the extraction property that this protocol satisfies is uh, what is called two special soundness, where if the prover can answer two different challenges for the same first message A, um, then we can actually extract the witness. Um, so if the prover can only answer one challenge, then the probability of the verifier accepting a cheating proof is, is very small. Um, and say that the prover answers two different challenges for the same first message, then we know that the prover knows the witness because we can exhibit an explicit uh, extractor that gives us this witness. And the extractor um, uh, simply divides the two equations and we can get X. And because C is different from C prime, uh, this is well defined. Um, what about zero knowledge? So this doesn't seem to satisfy full zero knowledge, but it satisfies what is called honest verifier zero knowledge. Um, so if the challenge does not depend on the first message A and it's indeed chosen um, from the correct distribution, um, then we can simulate uh, by simply choosing, uh, by doing things out of order, we can choose the prover's third message Z, uh, choose C and then compute A as determined by the verification equation. And then we can argue that this has the same distribution as in the real execution. 
Um, so this is the uh, template of a Sigma protocol where a prover sends a first message that we'll typically call A, the verifier sends a challenge string, and then the prover sends a response Z. And uh, we call this tuple, uh, the instance X and ACZ, the transcript, and the verifier uh, decides to accept or reject based on this transcript. Um, so we have, uh, we saw these properties, uh, completeness is satisfied and we have special soundness. Um, and this is uh, two special sound. We only need two accepting transcripts in order to extract the witness. And um, we have special honest verifier zero knowledge where um, the simulator can simulate even given C. Uh, this is the special HPCK property. Um, and we can convert this three round Sigma protocol into a non-interactive uh, protocol in the following way, where uh, the prover computes the first message as usual. And now, uh, since we don't allow interaction from the verifier side in order to receive the challenge, the prover um, is going to apply uh, some hash function on the instance and the first message to derive the challenge locally on its own, and then compute the third message as usual and send uh, the tuple ACZ in one go. So this is the uh, NISIC obtained by uh, compiling uh, the three down sigma protocol. Um, and the field Shamir transform is actually a more uh, general transform to remove interaction um, from interactive protocols where we can transform a public coin uh, interactive argument into a non-interactive uh, argument. Uh, though this was originally proposed to transform um, identification schemes into a signature scheme, um, th this view is, uh, is sort of the more uh, modern view of the field Shamir transform. Um, so we have an interactive argument where uh, the prover and the verifier interact in several rounds. And this is public coin in the sense that the, the verifier's messages are, um, are, um, are chosen uniformly at random. The, the Cs are all coming from, um, are randomly chosen. And now um, in the non-interactive argument compiled uh, using Fiat Shamir, um, the prover is going to send the first message and then um, apply uh, the hash function on everything it has so far in order to derive C1, uh, send the second message, then derive uh, the second challenge by applying H on, again, everything it has seen so far, and so on. Um, so now um, we ask about simulation extractability of fiat Shamir compiled protocols, where fiat Shamir is uh, what we just saw. And um, the known result is uh, from this paper um, that appeared in Indocrypt in 2012 that FS compiled uh, Sigma protocols satisfy simulation extractability. Um, and these techniques do not extend to other protocols that do not have this three move Sigma protocol template. Uh, in particular, it doesn't apply to protocols that require more than three uh, messages. Um, to protocols that require more than two transcripts to extract. So we saw that Sigma protocols are two special sound, um, but some protocols need more than two transcripts to extract. And uh, in addition, we have to take care of uh, a common reference string that is uh, moreover updatable. Uh, Chaya, can I ask you a question? The Killian's yeah. uh, protocol is three more. Uh, will this apply to Killian's protocol? I mean, it doesn't require a CRS, but... Uh... Do you know? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. So this paper um, is for Sigma protocols that satisfy some properties. And I don't know if Killian's protocol satisfies those properties. Uh, it has to be like... unique response. Yeah, they require uh, what is see, called I unique see. response, which I'll talk about. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah. Um, so um, let me begin by giving like a very abstract uh, bare bones view of the kind of protocols we'll be considering. So I'm, I'm stripping protocols of all complexity and this is a very simplistic view, uh, but I just want to focus on the challenges that arise in order to show simulation extractability. So I'll be focusing on very um, specific parts of the protocol and this is by no means how uh, ZK snarks look. Okay, so we have an instance and a witness and um, these are encoded into some intermediate constraint system. Um, which can either be uh, R1CS yes, or circuit satisfiability and so on. And uh, the instance and the witness are uh, encoded as polynomials. Again, this can either be the coefficients of a polynomial um, or, um, or by interpolating. Uh, so, so that doesn't matter. Uh, I only want to focus on the point that the witness is encoded as a polynomial that is committed to by the prover. And the way the protocol proceeds is uh, by using what is called a polynomial commitment scheme. And the first message from the prover is typically a commitment 
um, to the witness polynomial, to the polynomial that encodes the witness. And by a polynomial commitment scheme, I mean a commitment scheme where uh, one can commit to a polynomial such that the size of the commitment is independent of the degree, so it has succinctness. And uh, given the commitment, uh, the prover can later open the polynomial um, at an evaluation point together with the short proof such that the verifier can verify um, that the evaluation point is correct um, and consistent with the committed polynomial. Um, so the prover commits to uh, the polynomial that encodes the witness. And then typically there is a, a, ch a random challenge, which is the evaluation point where the verifier is challenging the prover to open these polynomials. And in the Fiat Shamir version, this is computed by the prover. And the prover opens these polynomials at this challenge point. Um, and again, stripping things of all details, uh, the verifier basically verifies certain polynomial identities at a point. Uh, instead of verifying that certain equations hold as polynomials, and then verifies the correct evaluation of committed polynomials. And now um, the challenges in showing simulation extractability of a protocol uh, that looks like uh, what we saw just now um, are the following. Um, first, we don't have um, tightness going from the interactive argument to uh, the fiat shamir compiled one, and this is true even for proof of knowledge, not just uh, simulation extractability. Um, the second problem is um, about programmability. Um, I, I'll talk about this more. Um, there will be problems in handling the adversaries random oracle queries. In particular, uh, we will not be able to program uh, the RO the way we would like. Um, the third problem, which is specific to uh, CRS-based protocols, is that now the adversary has more power in contributing to the randomness of the CRS uh, before attempting to forge a proof uh, with respect to that CRS. Um, so let's begin by talking about the first problem. Um, so we have uh, the prover in the non-interactive world has additional power over the prover in the interactive world. So what this prover can do is uh, begin proving a certain instance X, uh, commit, to the, um, commit to whatever it is supposed to commit to, and if it doesn't like a certain challenge, uh, then sort of give up and uh, go back and try to prove a different instance. And uh, th this can happen even in the middle of the protocol. If the prover does not like a certain challenge, it can go back and try again uh, by sending a different message in one of the earlier rounds. And um, this is something that the interactive prover cannot do where it only has uh, sort of one shot to convince the verifier. So a non-interactive prover can uh, try again if it doesn't like a certain challenge. Um, and usually soundness and proof of knowledge are only analyzed in the interactive setting, um, especially for the protocols that I talked about, like uh, bulletproofs and Marlin and Plonk and Sonic. Um, and later, um, the, uh, it, it is assumed for the Fiat Shamir transformed version. However, uh, for a protocol with um, R challenges, uh, this is a public coin protocol, we know that if there was a soundness or an extraction error of epsilon, um, then there is a multiplicative loss uh, in the Fiat Shamir compiled version. Uh, the error is Q to the R times epsilon. So there's a degradation in um, extraction or soundness error. And if you think about um, logarithmic round protocols like bullet proofs, um, this guarantee is uh, not meaningful um, because R is not even constant. Uh, Chaya, can I ask a quick question? I thought there mm -hmm. were some recent works that actually yeah, I, showed yeah. this is... Oh, yeah, yeah, no I was trying to talk about okay. that, yeah. Sorry, sorry for jumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. Um, so what we need here is the notion of uh, state restoration um, that takes care of uh, this additional power that the prover has. And uh, state restoration is the following notion um, where we give the interactive prover this additional power to restore the verifier to a previous state and resume execution uh, from there on. Right, so, uh, so it starts from a certain uh, verifier state S0, receives a certain challenge, goes on executing. This transcript results in uh, a non-accepting transcript. The prover does not like it. So now the prover can restore the verifier to an earlier state uh, and try again. It can try uh, with A1 prime and C1 prime and so on. And if this also results in a non-accepting transcript, it can again restore the verifier to previous state and uh, resume its execution from there until it gets an accepting transcript. Um, so we say that the adversary wins in this game if there is an accepting transcript in this execution tree.
And um, the recent work of um, Ghoshal and Tesaro in Crypto 2021 um, show state restoration proof of knowledge for bullet proofs in the AGM. Um, and this tightly implies proof of knowledge for the Fiat Shamir compiled version of bullet proofs. And this gets around um, the problem with the um, multiplicative QTR loss. Uh, but this is in the idealized model of algebraic group model, um, where we assume that the adversaries are algebraic, which means that every time an adversary outputs a group element, it is also going to output the representation of that group element in terms of everything it has seen so far. So this, uh, this work addresses the, um, the loss uh, issue from occurring from the fiat shumay transform. Um, and we sort of uh, base our work on this in order to prove simulation extractability as well. Um, so let me say a little bit about how we show simulation extractability of bullet proofs. So our starting point is the work of um, Koshal and Tesaro, and we extend the result to show simulation extractability by showing um, online adaptive simulation extractability in the AGM. And by online, I mean that the extractor um, does not need to rewind the prover um, instead, it can simply look at an accepting transcript and extract the witness. And it can do this because we are in the AGM. The extractor gets to see the representations um, that the algebraic adversary outputs as well. So the second issue in showing simulation extractability of bullet proofs is in handling the random oracle queries. Um, so let me illustrate this by um, looking at a straightforward way that would occur in order to prove simulation extractability. So one straightforward attempt is to simply um, um, simulate the uh, proof queries of the adversary by using the HPZK simulator of um, the underlying protocol and uh, program the RO. And then um, forward all the random oracle queries to the state restoration oracle of the um, underlying state restoration POK game. Um, however, this straightforward idea does not work because um, if the forged proof returned by the adversary has a matching prefix with one of the simulated proofs, um, then we cannot use this forged proof in order to break state restoration proof of knowledge. This is because um, we are programming the random oracle in two different ways, uh, one which is used by the simulator of the HVCK and one that is coming from the state restoration oracle that is returning the challenges. Um, so the state restoration oracle uh, has no knowledge of simulated proofs and any partial transcript that has a matching prefix with a simulated proof is not going to be in the execution tree. And therefore, um, the state restoration POK adversary uh, does not win. So to get around this, uh, what we need is a property called the unique response property. Um, this is also the property that was required from the three round sigma protocols of the existing simulation extractability result, which roughly says that um, given um, A and the challenge C, uh, there is a unique response Z that makes the transcript accepting. So we try to define unique response for bullet proofs, um, which which roughly um, extending the existing definition would say that the adversary cannot produce two accepting transcript uh, differing from the ith message. So pi and pi prime cannot be both accepting if they have uh, a common prefix. Um, however, the bad news is bullet proofs does not satisfy this uh, simply because there are certain rounds in the protocol where the prover sends um, randomized messages. Um, in, in the third round, the, in the third round of the bulletproof protocol, the prover is sending uh, certain commitments, which are Peterson commitments that are uh, randomized. And therefore, the adversary can trivially break unique response by simply choosing different um, randomness that is used inside the commitment. Uh, Chaya, quick question. Uh, here, when you spy and pi prime, they differ in the ith round or ith message, meaning like ith round for me is two messages, ith message is just one. Uh, yeah, by ith message, I mean the ith prover's message. So it has to differ in the A's. Starting only, the A's. only, only in one A. Uh, starting from starting from the ith A, it could differ starting from the ith A. Okay. Um, so bullet proofs does not satisfy uh, the unique response property, um, but the observation um, is that the unique response definition is perhaps too strong. Um, it suffices to require um, unique response for a fixed honest transcript instead of asking 
um, that both transcripts be adversarially generated. So we put forth the notion that we call weak unique response, which basically says that given one accepting transcript pi, the adversary cannot produce another accepting transcript um, that has a prefix up to the ith message. Um, and uh, uh, morally, uh, this is sort of uh, similar to collision resistance versus second tree image resistance for a hash function, um, where one is weaker than the other and it's easier to prove. And we show that uh, this weak unique response suffices uh, to show simulation extractability of bullet proofs. It suffices that one of them um, be an honest transcript. Both need not be adversarially generated. Um, okay, so um, here is a very uh, rough roadmap of uh, how we get to simulation extractability of bullet proofs. Um, we start with the state restoration proof of knowledge uh, result from the GT21 paper. Um, we use HVZK that is already known uh, for bullet proofs. Um, and we show that it satisfies state restoration unique response and show a tight reduction to um, the fiat shamir weak unique response. And combining fiat shamir extractability, uh, non-interactive zero knowledge and weak unique response, we show that the fiat shamir transformed bullet proofs satisfies simulation extractability. Uh, and, and this is all in the AGM. So now I'll say um, just a few words on the uh, second result, which is about simulation extractability of uh, CRS-based uh, ZK SNARKs. Um, and uh, most uh, widely deployed protocols like Marlin, Plonk, and Sonic all fall into this class of uh, protocols. Um, so similar challenges, um, um, similar challenges are faced in, uh, in the second uh, class of protocols as well. Um, where um, the extractor now uh, has rewinding access to the prover and now cannot reprogram the random oracle. So typically uh, an extractor would work as follows. Um, the adversary outputs a certain commitment. Um, it makes random oracle queries, receives responses. Um, the extractor uh, outputs uh, a challenge point at which the prover is going to open the commitment and then sort of rewinds the adversary to send a different challenge, obtain a different opening, and thus obtain multiple transcripts and extract a witness from these multiple transcripts. But now if we think about extraction in the presence of a simulator, which now the adversary has in the simulation extractability definition, the adversary could potentially utilize a simulated proof up to a partial transcript. This is like before. So the problem is morally like before, but technically a bit different because um, in bullet proofs, we were in the online extraction setting, whereas here um, we have uh, extraction by rewinding. And here the problem is that um, the extractor cannot rewind and program the random oracle to a different response because now the adversary that has access to the simulator would notice. So for, for different reasons, we again need the same property, which is that of um, unique response. Um, and thankfully we can show that uh, Sonic, Plonk and Marlin and mostly protocols that are all based on, based on the KZG commitment scheme um, satisfy the unique response property. Um, the other problem we have in this setting is that of um, having a common reference string and being in the updatable setting, um, the adversary uh, has more power. So recall in the updatable CRS setting, um, parties can continuously perform updates on the CRS um, and then give proofs with respect to an updated CRS. So now uh, in the simulation extractability definition, uh, as before the prover has uh, Oracle access to a simulation Oracle, uh, but now additionally, um, the prover has access to what we call an update Oracle um, where the adversary can perform updates on the uh, CRS. And uh, whenever the adversary is happy with all the updates it has performed, uh, it gets the simulation oracle with, with respect to the last uh, CRS. And now the definition is as before, um, we ask that there exists an extractor that outputs um, a valid witness um, whenever the uh, prover gives an accepting proof, uh, which is new, which is not in the set um, of instance proof pairs that it has seen. 
So, so the difference is in giving the adversary the access to the update oracle. Um, and here uh, we show a general theorem for simulation extractability for um, updatable CRS-based SNARKs. And uh, then we show that Plonk, Marlin, and Sonic satisfy the preconditions of the theorem, which implies that all of these are simulation extractable uh, as per our uh, proposed definition. Um, so this, this paper should be on ePrint soon. Um, so I want to conclude uh, by just saying that uh, there are plenty of applications where ZK SNARKs are used and there are plenty of potential applications. Um, and um, these are never in the standalone setting. And for ZK SNARKs to be um, to enable powerful applications, um, it has to be non malleable. And uh, there are plenty of open questions like simulation extractability of bullet proofs in the plain random oracle model without the AGM. Um, and in the second result for CRS based SNARKs, um, we don't have tightness uh, for the FS, uh, for the Fiat Shamir versions. Uh, I I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Can I ask a question? Yeah. A more philosophical one. You mentioned there are a random mortal model and AGM. What is, how do you think about the use of, of these proofs in the real world where uh, the, the random mortal model and the AGM are not, don't necessarily correspond to how things happen in the real world? Um, yeah, uh, I think it is more true for AGM than for the random oracle um, model. Um, uh, I think it is it is reasonable uh, to expect that for some protocols, uh, going from the random oracle model to a concrete hash function is okay. Um, whereas for AGM, um, we do have recent results that shows how to instantiate this under falsifiable assumptions, but that is at the cost of efficiency. Um, so AGN, um, I, I view it as still a limitation because um, we are only thinking about a class of adversaries that also give us uh, representations. And let me also push again and then on the random Oracle model, if you need programmability in the random Oracle model, is that still like a property that you would consider, you know, consistent with the real world? Um, yeah, I mean, programmability is definitely a strong property uh, to require, but um, but I think um, it is it is better to have a proof in the programmable random Oracle model uh, than no proof at all. I agree about that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, let me stop recording. Uh...